Alright, Roofless fans, yep, I went ahead, woke up early, around 5.30, and I just watched the episode. This was Season 2, Episode 6, entitled Trust No One. And to be honest, this episode certainly lived up to its name. Now, that's not to say it didn't have its slow moments. Um, you know, as I've been saying in recent videos, uh, you know, a lot of other fans have been saying the same thing, that these episodes have been moving at a snail's pace. We're just sitting through the same kind of scene episode to episode hey i don't trust this person no we should trust them we're going to escape later tonight i don't think you should and everybody's questioning each other's loyalty while fans are questioning when the story is going to move forward not to mention it's uh by the time we get towards the middle or the back or the final like third of the episode it is nighttime showing that yet another day has passed and Tally is still in the compound, meaning that she's out. Basically, if you've been paying attention, Tally has outlived her lifespan on the Oval <laughs> when she should be dead in the continuity of Ruthless, but that's neither here nor there. So before moving forward in the video, please take a moment to hit that like button. Go ahead and follow me on social media. Links are in the description below. Hit the bell notification icon and select all. That way you don't miss out whenever I post new content to the channel. And finally, make sure you hit that subscribe button. I mean, if you've been a long time subscriber, just double check to make sure YouTube hasn't kicked you off the channel. Also, if you are a frequent viewer but you've never subscribed, feel free to remedy that right now by hitting subscribe. We're still at like 32.2% uh, subscriber watch time. I'm trying to get up to 40 or 50% as soon as possible. And originally, you know what, I have 8 out of 10 written down on my notepad. I feel like that's a bit too high, but I do feel that both the opening scene, I think that Andrew was the MVP of the episode, because without the Andrew scenes, I think this episode probably would have gotten like maybe a 6 out of 10. But then Ruth had one specific one-liner that made me laugh so hard. So let me just break it down in the actual episode review. And we could talk about it together in the comment section below. Sorry about that. I need to minimize my Facebook um, tab. I forgot that was on. Just got a message. But more to the point of this uh, episode, we pick up where we left off where, you know, Andrew is defending himself against Daikon's accusations. It's like, brother, I can tell by the way you move, the way you talk, the way you spit. It just screams cop. <laughs> And it's like, well, I killed my wife for the highest in the Waku. Isn't that a bit too convenient? That's what I believe. <laughs> Basically, and I was thinking like, damn, how is Andrew going to get out of this one? Because, you know, once uh, Daikon has a scent on somebody's deception, it's pretty hard to uh, get him off the trail. But Andrew pretty much takes it to the next level. You know, he, he talks back, you know, because usually when Daikon barks, people kind of back down. I mean, he, no matter how confident they are or how tired of his shit they are, they'll be like, yes, brother Daikon. I'm sorry, brother Daikon, but this time, you know what? I'm sick of your shit. Watch your mouth. No, I'm sick of this. I gave up everything for the highest, for the Raku. My career, my family, my wife. I got nothing left. And I'm tired of you questioning me. You better watch him out. And then Andrew pulls a gun out of thin air. And then he's like, oh shit, where are we going with this? So then he puts the head, uh, he puts the gun to his head. I'm like, Lord, are we going to see him die within the first three minutes of the episode? Already I'm like, damn, this episode of Ruthless within the first like 90 seconds has me more intrigued than last night's entirety of Sisters. And that includes the ending of the episode where Jasmine came in with a gun. So he takes it even further by grabbing Daikon's wrist and making his hand go on the gun, essentially being like, you know what? If you don't trust me, then go ahead and pull the trigger because I ain't got nothing left. I ain't got no family, no career. I done gave up everything. So, if, brother, if you think I'm lying, if you think I'm not loyal to the cause or you think I'm a cop, pull the trigger. I ain't got nothing left to live for. And he's like, no, don't be looking around at other, every other, um, because Daikon's like, look, you need to stop this. And he keeps looking around. No, brother, you think you question? No, no, no. You stop looking around. You look at me. You look at me. Pull the trigger. Pull the trigger, nigga. He ain't say that, but it rhymed. So, um, Daikon makes him put the gun down and then he is, he, I think he like takes the gun or he makes him, I know he's like, let go of my arm. So basically the gun goes down and 
there's a moment of calm because I'm thinking to myself, okay, like, is Andrew being convincing enough or what? This was a very good scene. So basically, Daikon actually opens up like saying, you know what? I was tested myself. And Andrew's like, you had to kill your wife too? The highest made you do that? No. It was my girlfriend. Oh, Daikon. And she was pregnant. Oh, Daikon. But I must do whatever it takes to protect the highest. No, brother. We have to do whatever it takes. Come drink with me. Okay, Daikon. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, what about your lucky stick? <laughs> so they walk off. All right, then we go over to um, Poke's place, and he's there waiting for Melinda. And she's still being so mysterious, not telling him where she was, who she was with. Um, apparently, she got a job with someone. It's not a male. It's a female. Don't worry about it. And she says she only has about one hour to be with him. So he's like, well, I just want to make sure you're taken care of. You're not taken advantage of and, you know, keep you safe. So then they go have sex to knock him out because, you know, that's how he goes to sleep really quick. I don't know if that means. Um, no, I don't think she drugged him or anything. I just think that, you know, he was tired. So then we go over to Tally and one of the elder mothers. Uh, Tally's doing laundry and she's being assigned to move from her trailer immediately. I believe that she's moving from the trailer with Ruth to the yellow trailer that has Paula, Lacey, Zane, and Joan is also in there too. All right, so Tally goes to the trailer and they and they talk for a little bit only because the elder mother comes in to rush them, but they're just talking about the situation. Uh, Roof is recapping the fact that the highest is out of it. You know, he's high on drugs. I mean, even when I was with him, mo most of the time, he was just strung out. He's crazy. He's paranoid. Tally, there was flush in his hair when I was giving him that damn bath. So after that, you know, Tally's like, look, I'm sorry about everything. You were right about Yancey. I'm in a bad spot. He wants me to see him tonight because if I don't, he's going to tell the highest on me. I'm like, what? He was. She was like, what? So after that, uh, Roof said, you know what, I'll talk to Andrew. Maybe he can help with this situation because essentially it's blackmail. Uh, basically, Yancey's like, you come have sex with me again or I'm going to tell the highest what you did about, you know, trying to seduce me, getting the keys to see your daughter and you're going to be punished. So, Elder Mother comes in and makes Tally get the hell out of there as soon as possible because she's taking too long. It's like, why are you taking so long, girl? You ain't even got that much stuff. She has like one of those small little white laundry baskets. So trust me, it's not a lot. So, she tells Ruth that the big hog was killed, meaning that there's going to be a big feast tonight. I believe it was mentioned somewhere in like season one that during the full moon, there's always like a Raku festival or whatever. But I guess because not to jump too far ahead, but in the towards the end of the episode, even Melinda's like, wait, I thought it was a celebration tonight. Why is it so quiet? But, you know, Ruth lets her know about the runaways and that pretty much killed the mood for any kind of celebration. All right, so then we go over to Zane, and, well, you know, again, just the same old repetitive dialogue, but these girls are so fine, I don't really care. But here we go. Uh, Zane is warning Paula and Lacey about the fact that escaping tonight is not a good idea. Like, what if Joan, who said she's in on the escape, set those people up to get caught and killed? But, you know, Paula and Lacey ain't trying to hit out of the loop. We getting the hell out of here right now. Um, but then they also question the fact that Joan doesn't know about the car keys, and they're like, why? Wait, what do you mean? And Lacey's like, look, she just doesn't know, okay? Because if you recall, she was the one that got the keys from um, Oliver. So, you know, Joan isn't in on that particular plan. Joan comes in, and I believe this is the first time we learn that she lives in that same trailer. But she comes in, sits down, and she apologizes because she didn't know about, you know, what would happen to the runaway. She thought she thought of everything. She didn't know they would be caught and killed. But, hey, shit happens. Uh, so she goes to the back bunk and, you know, the girl's like, I don't trust her anymore. So after that, uh, Tally is moved in there and basically her and Joan are going to be the overseers of this particular trailer, which has me thinking, OK, hypothetically speaking, let's say that, you know, the girls get in the car and get the hell out of there. Would that mean Tally and um, Joan would be punished because they were supposed to watch over the trailer? But then two of their members, assuming Zane doesn't go, two of the members, Paula and uh, Lacey, took the car and got the hell out of there. Does that mean um, those two will be punished and then that could lead to Tally escaping, I guess? Maybe they'll get in the car? Who knows? So we move on from there that... Well, Tally just... This is a brief conversation. It's just the same old, same old. 
Tally is suspicious that the elder mothers moving them in together in order to keep an eye on the other. It's like, okay, one elder mother told you to watch over me, and then the other elder mother told me to watch over you. But Jones says that isn't the case. But Tally's like, you know what? Don't, no, don't even think you can trust me because guess what? You can't trust anyone. Trust no one. That was the title of the episode. All right, so Roof is up there doing the highest nails. He's just like a little kid. Oh, get my nails done. So uh, Elder Mother comes in, and you know she's still jealous about the whole bath thing. So how was the bath? She did good. You taught her well, Elder Mother. Oh, is that so? Yeah, she does excellent work on my nails, pedicures, and manicures. And again, you could just see the jealousy written all over her face. But, um, girl, go. Oh. Really? He's like, anything else I can do for you? No, you can go. Are you sure? Girl, she told he told you to go. Watch your place. Okay. And then it's like, Ruth gives the highest little look. <laughs> you know, like, oh yeah, you're going to get something later. So then she leaves the trailer. But basically the highest is kind of semi-fed up with the elder mother in the same vein as Daikon, where it's like, look, there's no need to be jealous. It's like Daikon with uh, River and Marva with uh, Ruth. But she just wanted to see if he was okay after everything that went down. And everyone is on their best behavior. Oh, were they not beforehand? Basically, in regards to coming back to the trailer covered in blood. But she's like, oh, no, it's just the fact that they needed um, a reminder of who you are, how powerful you are. And we learned that the murder victims, um, Daikon, well, the highs had Daikon and a few of his guys bury graves for them and they're buried underneath the gardens oh that'll be good for the fertilizer wait what okay that's uh creepy as hell so essentially they grow their food from funeral homes if you will or graveyards so basically the grave i guess you could say the runaways get makeshift graveyards in the garden so basically they're eating the dessert we're eating the deserters. They basically provide the fertilizer and the fuel for the food that we eat here in the compound. Damn. Savage. So basically after that, you know, the high is like, bring me my dinner and the board in regards to William. Oh, we'll get to William soon enough. All right. So then we go over to Oliver and Clark. Uh, Clark is coming back from assignment, the grave digging. And um, he tells Oliver, hey, have a 20 minute break. You've been out here, what, all day without a break? And he calls him out for, you know, being off. It's like, you've been off for a little while, man. It's like, just something wrong. Is it Lacey? No, it's not Lacey. Well, look, we can't have each other's back if we're not honest with each other. It's like, no, I'm okay, brother. I'm okay. <sighs> fine. Okay, fine. So it was like, you'll tell me eventually. So he's like, uh, I'll wait until I'll wait until you get back from break to, uh, you know, talk to Daikon. And we'll go from there. So then we go over to Roof and River. I believe River was waiting for Roof outside of the trailer because Elder Mother told her to go to her trailer. Like, leave now. So Roof is just too through with River and probably one of the best lines of the episode. What kind of name is River for a nigga? <laughs> I, I mean, that kind of rhymes. Just the, but the way she did, it's kind of like Eminem in his rap lyrics where it's like two words that don't rhyme. But the way he says it, it rhymes. What kind of name is River for a nigga? That earned a point. Seriously, that's another reason the episode got an 8 out of 10 instead of like a 7. So, basically, River is like, so did it work? Um, and he wants to let Ruth entirely in on the plan. That's basically the uh, gist of everything. Basically, I want to let you in on everything we got going on. Ruth just wants to steer clear because of the fact, look, I just cleaned flesh out of that man's hair. So, following you upstream might not be the best move, River. So, she's done with him. All right, and he's like, what, you can't you can't keep being mean to me. You need me. He's like, if you don't get your goddamn hands off me. Okay, so then we go to Melinda, who, man, this girl could not catch a break in this episode. She's at the Elder Mother's trailer, and basically this scene is just to recap everything in regards to her assignment at the sheriff's office. She's infiltrated it via poke. Her and some of the guys took some photos. Um... And Elder Mother reminds her not to be so eager. Um, the fact that you're doing good work, but just be just because you're dressed like a whore. There's a difference between being dressed like one and acting like one. Because for some reason, she's just super eager. I can't wait to meet the highs. I can't wait to meet the highs. Girl, stop drinking coffee. So essentially after that, she's just told off, go take a bath. You stink of evil. And so, so she tells Ruth to take Melinda to get a bath as well as find the boy for the highest, William. 
So, yeah, uh, Melinda's just, you know, eager to do the job of the Raku, but at the same time, she's being told to remember her place. And I know there's like, this scene was a little lengthy, but that's honestly all that came from it. So we go to nighttime. Lacey is approaching Oliver. I believe that Zane and um, Paul are like, go, go talk to him, go talk to him. So he asks her about the car key. She denies it saying, wait, what if you dropped it somewhere? Uh, Oliver, what if one of the kids picked it up or go see Yancey? Yancey has all the keys for everything around here. Maybe he found the keys. So after that, you know, she pretty much is like, do you still believe? Yeah, I still do. Do you believe? Of course. But what if the government comes in here? Then we'll fight to the death. It's like you said there are runaways. What if one of them, what if somebody eventually runs away, goes to the sheriff's office, and then the government comes in? Then we'll keep fighting. So they split ways. I guess this was probably Lacey's test to determine whether or not she could run away with Oliver tonight. Or it's just the fact that he's too embedded in the Raku, and there's no point of trying to convince him to leave if he's not going to leave. All right, then we go over to Andrew and Daikon drinking. I guess they spent the entire, like, afternoon evening just you know drinking i forgot if it's daylight savings time or not so i don't know if it gets dark early or what so um he can tell that Di uh andrew's tense so he kind of like you know massage his shoulder and he's like um no it's not working i'm not a tense brother i don't know what you i don't, I don't know it's kind of funny because you can tell he was into it not not that it's gay to have another man rub your shoulders but at the same time it's like he could tell that well then again Look at Andrew's perspective. The last time he gave Daikon some good news, he got kissed when he showed the proof of killing his wife. So I don't think he's trying to be in a situation like that with Daikon again. But you can tell that the massage was working. He's like, no, just, it's just, oh, you don't drink a lot. It's like, you know, I don't really drink a lot of beer. I don't really like the way it makes me feel. I guess I, maybe Daikon was trying to loosen him up. I don't know. But in any case, they briefly talk about, um, you know, urges and what it takes to get rid of it was like you masturbate no i don't brother then what do you do i just don't allow my mind to go in those places <laughs> so then he goes on to say say i want to see it. have you heard of big dick excuse me i'm going to be honest here i completely forgot about this storyline until we got a little further in the conversation what if i brought lacy in here it's like you know you want to i I'm not going to show you my dick, brother. You've already seen it. Yeah, but it was covered by your cloak. What if I brought Lacey in here? Because Andrew's like, look, there's nothing in here that makes, turns me on. What about Lacey? Lacey? Who's that? And basically, remember several episodes ago when Lilo said that, you know, after being in Lacey or the other guys that, you know, were gang raping her, they said, you know, it was wide in there, meaning that somebody with a big dick had already been inside of her before you lead on the guys but then i love how andrew flipped this around saying well you, did you ever think that lilo was small oh you're right <laughs> it's like these these character moments like this are what i love more than just the repetitiveness of the same old dialogue over and over again because like i said before i honestly had forgotten about the whole the big dick search it's like you know it's like star search but for dicks Look, I'm sorry to be vulgar, but this is rated M for mature. When the sun go down. Anyway, because remember, it was like, you know, Daikon was telling Clark to find out who. Oh, yeah, yeah. This was like back in season one. Yeah, yeah. Towards the back half of season one where Clark was on assignment to go look at everybody's dick <laughs> and see who has a big one to determine who was, you know, effing Lacey. And then he saw Oliver and then that's how he figured it out. And that's how those two got close over a dick. Weird, huh? So after that, um, <laughs> we go over to, oh yeah, he also learns who all of, I mean, Lilo was like, Lilo, I've heard of this guy. Who is he? The Senator's son, the highest parole officer, the cartel he works with. It's like nine, 99.9% .9 of the money that's flown through, uh, you know, pretty much flowing through here through the racketeering. We only get like point. It, it's basically the equivalent of Germex is like. It kills 99.9% .9 of, you know, germs, but that 0.1%, that's pretty much what the uh, compound gets in return. So, after this, we go over to the bath. Melinda's happy. Roof is a, a bit unbothered. It's like, I've already washed somebody's dirty ass today. Well, I got to do it again. So, you know, she learns a little bit about Melinda. She's 19. She's from Miami. She's just super excited about the assignment. I can't tell you what assignment I'm on. I, I mean, I'm not saying that she's out of character. I feel like we're seeing more 
of her, not because she's necking in the tub, but I mean, like, I guess we're seeing more of her personality as opposed to just being another plant. Um, so after that, you know, they just chat for a little bit. It's like, you know, Rufus trying to learn a little bit about who she is because you can tell this girl is super young and she's just blinded by the Raku, but when she has her eyes open, oh man. So, Elder Mother comes in and snaps at Roof to go get Daikon because the bath is taking too long and she just tells, you know, Melinda, wash yourself, girl. Well, I'm just so happy to wash yourself, okay? So, William actually pops into Daikon's trailer because, remember, uh, it's kind of been like a semi-running gag of the episode, you know, Where's the boy? Where is William? And I had forgotten that he was looking for, you know, his lucky stick. I mean, I mentioned that at the beginning of the video, but the episode kind of went to so many various characters and places, I semi forgot about it. But he comes in there and hands him the stick. And I'm thinking to myself, first of all, Andrew said the stick was as big as like a wishbone. This stick was pretty much like the same length of a stick that you would throw for a dog to play fetch. Okay. And I'm thinking to myself, he's like, oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. It's like, um, yeah, so just uh, go to my trailer, put it on my bed. And then Daikon's like, okay. Because I'm thinking, like, why wouldn't Daikon say anything? Because he was standing right there when um, Andrew described the size of the stick. And, I mean, the stick was obviously not the right one. But in any case, um, he goes outside. He's like, well, brother, uh, thanks for the beer. Maybe we could do this again sometime. Sure thing. So, Andrew goes to catch up with William and to thank him for finding the stick. He's like, oh, did you did you make it? Yeah, I did. I did. You're lying. Excuse me, brother. I made it. I knew you were lying, but I was trying to help you and to save myself. So, I, I guess that William was saying that the reason I, you know, took so long to quote unquote find slash make your stick was because it was to buy me time because it's the full moon, meaning that the highest would call for me to hurt me, to rape me, show me that move. And Andrew's like, brother, not now. But you said you would. Brother, if I show you, or excuse me, boy, if I show you that move, what are you going to do? What do you think is going to happen? Well, I mean, I could put him to sleep. Well, what are you going to do when he wakes up? Oh. <laughs> so, he's like, um... Here's what I can do. Go back to go back to your trailer. What, what do you mean? What? I want to help you escape later tonight. You need to get to the sheriff's office. Ask for Brian. I'm like, yes! And then um, after that, this fool runs off. Traitor! He's a traitor! Andrew catches his ass. And he tries to put him in like a sleeper hold. Basically, it looks like, yeah. And you hear a snap. Andrew killed William and hid the body underneath one of the trailers. He's like, why'd you have to do that, kid? Why? And the episode ends. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> so, this, with all these people trying to escape, I feel like there's going to be so many bodies buried in the compound that by the time the government does come, everybody's going to be dead. <laughs> holy shit. But yeah, this was an interesting episode. Like I said, um, even though there were the repetitive moments, just those moments between like Clark and Oliver, Daikon and um uh Andrew, Andrew and um um William. I feel like those scenes really made the episode shine in my opinion. But um yeah, let me know let me know your thoughts. Like I was like, "Damn, I didn't expect it to go that way. I thought William would be, you know, Oh my gosh, you're going to help me escape, really? Okay, great, great. Because, I mean, after everything he's gone through, because I think him and Melinda are around the same age. I think William is like, you know, in his late teens because he said he's been in the compounds for, you know, a few years because he's always been a runaway. But I did not expect the episode to take the turn it did, but we'll just have to wait and see what happens. I mean, you got people, where's Lilo? Where's Lilo? Oh, Lilo left, but then his body's in the trunk of the car. Then you got... Everybody asking for the boy, William, but it's like the boy's dead. So what's going to happen now? All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you liked the episode review and the fact I got it done quick, fast, and in a hurry. Uh, let me know your thoughts of this episode in the comment section below. And as always, if you would like to donate to the channel, feel free to do so on PayPal or Cash App. And please make sure you like and subscribe.